In this module, we're going to is the first of a two-part module or two-part clip. In that this part, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John itself. What we want to be looking at in this particular concept of John is to say, well, who was John then? What can we know about him? Well, first of all, his name is John. Uh, we know that he was the brother of James. And most probably the way in which it's written in the scripture, it says always James and John, which would seem to imply that James was the elder brother. We know that James was one of the first martyrs of the Christian church, uh, that he was killed. And so John is continuing. And there's the legend that believes that John would have been the only one out of the original disciples who actually lived to an old age and wasn't martyred, but potentially died from old age. We know from the writings of John's gospel that it is written by a Jew. Why do we say that? Well, because the gospel is filled with allusions, with connections to the Old Testament. There's lots of, of, uh, of references to the Old Testament. Also, the, the, there's, there's customs, there's, there's explanations, which only a real Jew would understand and would have connections with. The other thing we know about uh, John's, uh, or John is that he was the son of Zebedee. Now, the fact that they mention Zebedee's name is most probably means that Zebedee himself was also known within the Christian community. He was a fisherman, but not just a fisherman. It's certainly not like Peter and Andrew who were doing their own fishing. In fact, what it tells us when we read the synoptics is it says that there were hired hands there as well. Now, interesting thing with hired hands means that Zebedee obviously was a wealthy man, that he could actually hire other people to do the fishing as well as his own sons, James and John. And so really what we know about John comes mainly from the synoptics. In the gospel itself, in John's gospel itself, he never mentions his name. He is never mentioned. In fact, we get that, that strange phrase, the beloved disciple, or the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, we may think that that might be an arrogance, that he's being, oh, I'm the one that Jesus loved. But I think that it's not an arrogance as much as it is a statement of his connection, of his relationship with Jesus. Now, if we, if we imagine that Jesus might be in his middle 30s and John might be 14 or 15 years old, you can understand that the relationship between them would almost be like a father to a son or at least an elder brother to a younger brother. And almost you can imagine that there is that kind of relationship. Some have said, some commentators believe that James and John might even have been cousins of Jesus. And so therefore there was not only that relationship in, in friendship, but also a relationship through family. The evidence is unclear. But when we come to see who John was, we realize that most probably he was someone who from very close or very connected to Jesus and from very early was connected to him as well. That connection with Jesus continues even in the selection of that inner circle which Jesus creates. A circle within the disciples. Because it's the three disciples that Jesus chooses to go with him when those times were the special close times. So for example, we get James, John and Peter who go with Jesus to the transfiguration. Who go with Jesus uh, to go and heal the, the, lung, the little girl. It's with the three of them who end up being closest to him in the Garden of Gethsemane as he goes through the, the terror and the frightening parts of that night. John obviously was close to Jesus. And that closeness, that, that relationship that we see written within the fourth gospel and alluded to within the synoptics, I think is really the key to understanding John's gospel. Is that unless we understand that relationship and that closeness of relationship, we don't really understand why there's that reflection and that connection in reflection. What we see then in John's gospel is a story written by someone who is Jewish, who is most probably writing from Israel at the time or from Judea rather than from the diaspora. And he's writing for the whole church, but particularly those who would understand the Jewishness of Jesus. As I said before, the Jewish customs, the Jewish traditions are part of John's gospel. And because of that, therefore, the first audience would have been a Jewish audience. 
I believe that unless we understand that, we miss some of the nuance and we miss some of the, the things that we have to do in terms of reflection to understand John's gospel. John's gospel begins with Jesus being the Word made flesh. What John's wanting to emphasize to us is that Jesus didn't begin in the womb in Mary. That Jesus' beginning begins at the beginning of time as well. In fact, Jesus has no beginning because He is part of God. That He is the Word spoken by God, which brings all creation into being. And in the same way that as He is the Word that brings all creation into being, so He continues to be the Word that sustains and recreates and renews this creation. What John's trying to say is he's trying to create a cosmic Christ. A Christ that not only connects us to that time, but connects us to all time. And in fact, beyond time. Both beyond the beginning and after the end. When we see it that way, we really understand then John's writing of the five letters. Or the five pieces of his writing. Because he's not only writing about Jesus, but he's writing through into the end of time as well. And in fact, not just the end of time, but beyond what will happen after that process as well. Jesus is the one who brings not only the kingdom of God, as we see within the synoptics, but in fact gives us eternal life. For if Jesus has got no beginning and no end, then so we who become part of Him will also have no, no end. And so therefore, John's emphasis on eternal life in many ways is very similar to the synoptic emphasis on the kingdom of God, of the connection with what it means to be part of the kingdom and to live out that kingdom in this world. 